Welcome to Steps, a podcast celebrating people and their stories. Far too often, we don't give people the opportunity to share their journey, where they've come from, what they've overcome, and the amazing things that have happened in their lives. That's what we're going to do on Steps. We'll have real conversations with real people to understand how they've gotten to this place in time. Confucius said, the journey of 1,000 miles starts with a single step. So, let's start this journey. My name is Steve Wenzel. I'm a former college volleyball coach who has a passion for stories. In particular, other people's stories. Today's is a story that you're going to want to listen to. Our guest today is Lauren Carlini. Lauren is a native of Aurora, Illinois. She made waves as a top volleyball recruit for the class of 2013. We unpack what it was like being committed to a program amidst a coaching change and the decision she ultimately had to make. She played collegiately at the University of Wisconsin and post-graduation found her way into the pro volleyball scene and has played in Italy, Russia, and Turkey so far. As a member of USA Volleyball's women's national team, Lauren has had quite the success bringing in three gold medals, two silver medals, and two bronze medals in international competition. The highest honor she received was most valuable player and best setter in the 2018 Pan Am Cup tournament. Lauren shares with us her journey leading up to the Tokyo Olympics and the unexpected outcome for her and her quest for Olympic gold. There's so many different paths that we go down in this interview. I hope that you love every one of them. Now, let's get into the conversation with Lauren. Hello, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Ah, oh, you know what? I can't complain. Well, I can, but it doesn't. It does no good. We're here in uh, in Portland, Oregon, in the middle of our winter, right? So it's mm. rainy. It's gross. It's all of the above, and then some. Um, <laughs> How about for people that don't know where you're at and, you know, kind of, can you give an update? Let us know where you're at and the, where in the world is Lauren Carlini? Yeah, it's actually, most people think I'm still in the United States. I was posting about the Badgers going to the final four and everyone's like, are you going? Oh my God, I can't wait to see you there. And I'm like, I'm not even close people. Um, so I am in Istanbul, Turkey and playing my second professional team or season here fifth overall and very similar to portland weather right now just a little rainy and gross mid 50s um but hey making the most out of it and uh we've had a great first half of the season and we actually have one more match until i get to go home for christmas break so i'm super excited so and it, for people that don't understand right where you're you're playing pro you're in turkey and you say you get to go home for christmas right like <laughs> oh yeah me you know our other coaches other people that like like, oh, we're going to travel, we're going to go home, we're going to be home for a week or two, hang out with family, do this or this. That's not how it works for you, is it? Super rare that like we get, first off, any chance to really breathe more than three days free. Um, super lucky just here in Turkey because our league stops for middle to end of December uh, through beginning of January. So in this case, when I was in Italy and Russia, I did not get to go home for Christmas. Uh, we played on like 24 and 26, you know, like it, they did not care. Um, but in Turkey, I get to go home, I think on the 22nd and I'm fighting for six days at home right now, fighting for my life. Um, so hopefully they will give me the okay on that. But yeah, I mean, it's rare that we get to go home and celebrate with our family. So every hour we can get, like we utilize it. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be like, I appreciate you even taking time while you're there. Right. Because obviously you, you've got such a schedule you've got all these different things going on and can you can you share like the pro like it's different for me right and i joked about this i interviewed uh dusty a little while ago and i joked about i've never been out of the country right let alone to go work and do all of this stuff can you shed light on like the journey the pro journey like how'd you we can go as far back as you want getting into the pro journey but like you're in Turkey right now. How'd you land there? And you mentioned like you have to fight tooth and nail to get like days off. Like, I don't, I don't, yep. I don't fully grasp. I know a lot of people don't fully grasp. Like, it's not like, hey, I can just put in a, I want this week off of work. <laughs> it is wild. Um, it's so much different than college volleyball. College volleyball, you have tons of rules set by the NCAA in terms of um, hour limits per week and how much time you can actually be in the gym and meeting uh, together as a team because obviously you still have school and your education. 
um, and they try to prioritize prioritize that. Then you get into professional like leagues, and this is your job, like this is your livelihood, and so there are no limits to how much time you can have in the gym or do video sessions, um, and so. It was actually kind of a weird dynamic when I entered professional volleyball. There was a lot more free time in the day than I had when I was in college, right? College, you're bouncing from weights in the morning. Then you have to go to three classes. Then you have to go to study hall. Then you have afternoon practice. And then you have recovery, probably homework to do at night. So you always had something to do. I get into Scandici, Italy, uh, right outside Florence. And I'm like, we have one practice today for two and a half hours. Like, what am I going to do with all this extra time? (laughs) So there are a lot, there's a lot of times I just like sit and stare at a wall and I'm like, I have to get a hobby immediately because this is not going to work. Um, so that was one huge difference getting into professional volleyball is trying to figure out how to utilize your free time and be a little bit more productive about it. Um, and then, yeah, like what was the initial question? It was, how did I get into professional volleyball? Yeah, or like, yeah, yeah, what's, yeah. what's kind of the lay of the land right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess just like going back to free days, right? We, if we get one day a week, we are super lucky. Like we're pumped about that one single free day. Um, but again, we understand that what we're doing here is really freaking cool. Like we get to live overseas and immerse ourselves in a new culture. Um, if you're into it, learn a different language, try different foods, um, and we get paid to play a game. So yes, it can get frustrating at times having to fight for these things like free days and free mornings, but in the end, you realize this is such a great experience that most people will never get to have, and they have to pay to travel and all these extra things. So there is a lot of grateful moments that come along with it. Um, like with anything, there's positives and negatives. So tend to try to look on the bright side of things. <laughs> oh, and that's that's absolutely the way to do it. And again, like you, you hit on a whole bunch of different things that was very intriguing for me, right? Like you can learn a different language. You pick up a hobby out there. So like what languages have you learned or what languages have you dabbled in? Yeah. So Italy, they were one country where it, I would say it was very American-esque in terms of you live here, you're going to learn our language. Like that's how it is. Yeah. Um, even if girls could speak English on my Italian teams, they did not like, they were like, no, we're doing all of our practices in Italian. We're going to communicate in Italian period. So I can, I can get by in Italian. Um, it's pretty easy for me to converse. Turkish, uh, I don't know anything. <laughs> I've been here for almost <laughs> two full years. <laughs> but it's so crazy just like the pressures put on you from one place to another. Italy, I felt that I had to learn language. Turkey, never once have I felt the pressure to be like, no, you have to learn Turkish. Because our coach is Italian. Um, all of our practices are conducted in English. Um mm. So yeah, it's actually more on like the other girls and uh, sometimes it's about the composition of the team and where everyone is from. But um, yeah, and don't even ask me about Russia. Literally (laughs) nothing. I I was just floating through space that season. I didn't even, I barely existed. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So yeah, yeah, Russia was, so we've jumped, we've got Italy, we've got Russia, we've got, so like, can you tell, what's the time, what's the time frame? Like when you started playing pro, Mm because you graduated in what, 17? 2017. Yeah, 2017. Okay. So 17. So give us the timeline after that. Yes. First year overseas was in Scandici, Italy, uh, which is about, 15 minutes outside Florence. Second year, um, I went back to Italy, but a different team in Novara, uh, which is 45 minutes west of Milan. Third year, I went to Moscow, Russia, uh, and that is when COVID hit in that March of 2020. So that season ended early. And last season and this season, I've been with the same team, Turkish Airlines uh, in Istanbul, Turkey. So yeah, that's my timeline thus far. It's I, That's a pretty amazing journey. And again, because outside of... Moscow, and no offense to any of my Russian friends or people that have played there. Like, <laughs> the, it, the other stops sound pretty fascinating. It sounds like you, know, you can always, and again, obviously, just through our relationship and friendship and you know all the other athletes that you know, have got friendships with, uh, following along and seeing like all the places that you guys do get to go, it, like, like, oh my goodness, right? Then obviously Instagram, social media, it's all that stuff that gets put mm-hmm. out there. But it seems like it's a pretty cool journey, like you're saying. It really is. And I take a lot of like pride and happiness in breaking those boundaries or those barriers that people have about certain countries or certain places. And I would say, I know a lot of um, 
people hear Turkey and they're like, whoa, is it safe there? Do you feel safe? Like, are there people just walking around in full garb, you know, with the, the full coverings? And I'm like, in some places, I'm sure that's the case. But Istanbul is like any big city in the United States. And there are times where I honestly feel safer here than I do in downtown Chicago. Um, and a lot of people are always like shocked to hear that. Um, and then, of course, the pictures I post, uh, whether we're in Bodrum or Jundo or some of these beachy places, they're like, this is Turkey. This is nicer than San Diego. <laughs> like, what the hell? Right. And I'm right, like, right. I know. And it's literally less than half the price. It's insane. Um, so, yeah, I just really love like sharing all that content and showing people that it, sometimes your um, what's that called? predepositions and your the, views of things can you, be really yeah the preconceived just, notion yeah exactly it can be so different than what is reality and what's real 100 percent. well and again that's a that's an interesting transition keep kind of keeping in the pro space but mm-hmm. you know people have these preconceived notions you hear pro athlete you think millionaire you think this that and like again it, here in the united states right we you think baseball, basketball, football, you think all those things mm-hmm. very different for volleyball. And I, I was wondering if you might be able to kind of shed some light on the journey for you to get into pro, like what that looks mm-hmm. like. And again, you don't need to disclose like dollar amounts and stuff like that. But again, like contracts aren't multi, we're not talking multi million dollar contracts. Like, so can you shed some light on like the pro journey getting into it and some of the, like, I guess, breaking down some of those barriers that people may think are there? Yeah. So I would say with professional volleyball, um, you still get paid pretty well, um, especially if you're on the national team. Uh, I think that's a really good like kind of asterisk to put in there with the national team and being on the USA team. You do get a little bit of a boost of a contract boost. Um, and there is a few more, I guess, like bells and whistles that go on top of it in terms of a transfer fee um, and us getting part of that transfer fee. Um, that's a certain percentage of our contract that we signed for. Um, a lot of people, I mean, we still have agents that we work with. Um, luckily they actually don't take cuts directly from the athletes. They take it from the clubs that are paying for it. Um, and yeah, they're the ones who really just negotiate all the contracts for you. Um, these can be flights for you and your family, actual money, uh, bonuses and all again, just like the little things in case you're injured, Um, So they go through that and help through that process. Luckily, we don't have to deal with that directly. We're the ones that just sign on the dotted line. Um, Mm -hmm. But no, of course, people here, professional athletes. And even I was talking with one of our Turkish girls and their football soccer players get paid a lot of money here. And then I told her what some quarterbacks get paid in the United States. And she's like, dear, like how can someone, one single person get paid, you know, $400 million over a span of six years. Yep. And I'm like, you got me. <laughs> like it's, it's absolutely insane because we're not even making pennies compared to that. Um, of course that's sponsorships and that those are, you know, the quarterbacks of franchise quarterbacks. So it's very different, but yeah. I would say, um, it's still very cool. It's a great experience to have, but, um, you have to be really smart with your money still and put a lot away and um, Mm -hmm. just be really safe about it because you can't survive on the contracts that we're making for the rest of your life. You can be comfortable for a long time. um, But yeah, like anyone else, you just have to be smart and save your money. So what is, what is life after volleyball look like? And we'll obviously circle back around, but this is the perfect, like, I mean, again, your, (laughs) your degree, right. You know, you've got, you've got your certificate in entrepreneurship, you know, Mm -hmm. retail consumer behavior, like if volleyball ended tomorrow, what would you do? First, I would take (laughs) a long vacation. Okay. I would go all the places. I I haven't hit any of the cool places like Amsterdam, Prague. I'm going to hit all those places first. Then once I actually am running out of money, um, <laughs> I honestly don't know, Steve. Oh, of course, you're going to hit me with this question. I've I've pondered it and I've kind of been back and forth. I really yeah. do like this entrepreneurial spirit that a lot of people have. Though I don't think I personally have it. I really love hearing other people's stories and hearing what other people are passionate about. Um, so I've like thrown this idea around about passion projects and finding people who maybe 
And this can be something like small business owners. Like I try and shop small, even around the holidays and get gifts and support these um, entrepreneurs because I think what they're doing is really cool. They're doing what they're passionate about um, and they're sharing it with everyone. So getting into small businesses, getting into entrepreneurship, though, maybe not directly for myself um, or working with a brand with, um, I don't know, brand imaging, something to elevate a brand. Again, maybe starting mm -hmm. with a small business. That would be my first initial thing. Um, don't even ask about coaching. I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. I'm not <laughs> interested in it. I don't have the patience for it. Okay. I simply don't. Um, it's, yeah, so yeah that's a, it probably... takes a special person. <laughs> It's for sure. Uh, I don't have that patience. And I know a lot of people have asked if I would be like a color commentator or a broadcaster. And I have also entertained that idea, but I don't think I'm good enough with my words or quick enough. Um, though it would be really challenging and it could be fun. So I might dabble in that a little bit after volleyball as well. See, and what you, what you talked about, right? Like I've already got this vision and like, oh, what we, is and it? You, well, again, it's like, the name will change. I know this, but like Carlini consulting, right? Like, so literally mm -hmm. how, how can you set yourself up to be able to use your skill set, your strengths, mm -hmm. right? Your relatability, your overall vision, and you say brand imaging and all that stuff to then help small businesses mm -hmm. for nominal fees and then be able to build and create. So that way it's still passion for you. You have that entrepreneurial spirit, but like, it's not daunting. It's not overwhelming. Like I, I, it, we're, sure. we're going to make it happen. Wait. Okay. I think you just laid out my entire next 20 years. Thank you, Steve. Uh, yes. No worries. Consulting. I love yes. it. And it, you create the LLC, get it started. And for anybody Done. who's listening here, you know, hit Lauren up if you need help with yes. brand imaging or things like that. And we'll, we'll share all the, all of her contact info afterwards. So, Oh my God. Yay. This is, I mean, this is great. And you and, and this isn't the first time that you and I have you know been on screen together and everything. Obviously, mm -hmm. you mentioned COVID and you know my role with Adidas Volleyball and Sports Marketing Manager and all that stuff. And we we were lucky enough to where we did some of those little like surprise and delights, and we had you on with one of our clubs, right? And so and I and I bring that up from the fact that like you, you were talking with you know Dynasty, it was a Dynasty based out of Kansas, and mm -hmm. the the funny thing is like you're a complete and total natural in front of the camera and. So when you mentioned color commentating, all of that stuff, I think that's something naturally you can do. And mm -hmm. let's be honest, people don't know what they don't know. I, again, as I've started this podcast and continuing to go, right? Like one of my strengths, I, I joke about it. I'm a, I'm a serial dot connector and I, I love being in community and relationship with people. And that's something that mm -hmm. I think you do very well. So again, Thank doing you. stuff like this is also going to be natural for you from an advertising perspective, whenever you get Carlini and consulting up and rolling, but also, <laughs> right. That could be part of what you do like and create definitely whether it be uh, the possibilities are endless. Whew. And it doesn't have to be just one Avenue, right? There can be like all no. these little branches stemming off the main trunk. Like it could be absolutely a conglomerate. It can be this massive thing. Let's do it. Do we're good. We're going to talk <laughs> offline because let's we're going like, we're going to build this. I have I have I've got this vision. This is going to be You're great. Like the royalty fee is coming in for Steve. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is going to be great. So you heard it here first. Carlini Consulting coming soon. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. See, see, <gasps> see. So I and I love alliteration too. You earlier you mentioned Chicago, right? The streets yeah. of Chicago. Yeah, and that, that's you know that's where you're from. You know that general mm -hmm. area. Um, Aurora, right? If I'm not mistaken, Aurora, Illinois. Correct. Yep. So let's, let's kind of go back and let's go mm -hmm. like kind of childhood, your grow up, like your family, like talk to me. I mean, you're going home to see your family. Let's, yeah. let's dig in a little. I want to, I want to hear about your family. Yeah. So I started volleyball when I was super young, uh, mainly because my mom played volleyball in college at Appalachian, Appalachian state. And so Ended up starting in the gym uh, when I was five, six at the actual club level. And the youngest team at that time was 10U. So I was playing mm -hmm. with 10-year-olds when I was five or six. Um, played with that same club for 11 years. And it was my eighth grade year when I had to decide between softball and volleyball. And I know I've shared this story before, but I think it was just like, here was this path and there were two roads. And which one are you going to take? And at when I'm what, 12, 13 years old, having to make this really massive decision, it was like, whoa, this could be life altering. Um, volleyball, softball, you got to pick one. 
And I made the conscious decision and I said, I'm going to pick volleyball because I think it's going to get me farther in life. And I know that this is my true passion. So I look back to that decision that I had to make in that moment. And I was like, this is the greatest, biggest decision I ever made in my entire life. Um, Cause I get to, I look around and I'm living in East temple, Turkey playing professional volleyball with the USA team. And it's just been this incredible journey. And I've gotten to meet so many people and build so many relationships. And I know that all of that is going to really propel me into the future because like I've said before, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, um, especially when you get to this point in your life and your career. Um, so yeah, but circling back to childhood, um, my dad doesn't know a really anything. I'm, I'm going to be nice because I know he's going to listen to this podcast. <laughs> he Dad, I love you so much, but like volleyball really is not his forte. Okay. He was always our softball coach and we get on our asses and just, you know, always just this hard nosed guy, but volleyball right over his head, which is wow. Fantastic. You know, cause <laughs> he'll make his yeah. like comments after the game still. And I get a good giggle out of some of the terminology he finds. But if I literally asked him to point to the opposite, he'd be like, there What's an opposite? Who's an opposite? <laughs> what, what, before we go on, what, like, what's some of the terminology? Like, what's something that he said that you're like, oh, dad? Uh, it's just some of the weird things that, like, you don't say in America. It's like, oh, man, some of those spikes were so good. And, like, <laughs> um, you know, he'll be like, you're defensing like a ninja. And I'm like, I don't know if you can actually say that, but, like, thank you. Um, yeah, there's just... I wish I, if I could scroll through the text right now, we could find some good ones, but he like, he always says <laughs> his language car linguish because really he makes up his own terms and I love it. Much appreciated. Right, that, that's, <laughs> I would, I would love to put him and Karch in a room together and have them talk volleyball. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I mean, Karch, like, I mean, they were defensing like ninjas. What do you think about that? Yeah. <laughs> be like, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, in yeah. Karch, if you end up listening to this next time that you go on camera and like you're, you're announcing and doing color, feel free to use that. Defensing like yes. ninjas, you know, I mean, that's, and you just keep talking about spikes and taking it to yes, spike town and all of that. Spikes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. It's very basic level volleyball, but I don't mind it. I really don't. <laughs> and, and he's your dad, right? Like, I mean, that's the, of course, uh, like I'm a father, right? I've got a five-year-old daughter, a two and a half-year-old son, right? If my daughter wants to play volleyball, which we hope that she does, but if she doesn't, mm -hmm. great, she gets to choose. But like, as a dad, like you're gonna, like I know, and I know I can't speak for him, but I can speak for other dads that I've talked. Like you're gonna support unconditionally, and it's it's the quirkiness, it's all of that stuff that's completely amazing, and then it makes you uniquely dad. And just like you said, the unwavering support and. um our, one of our matches was 1 p.m. here, um, and they are nine hours behind us. So he asked the day before, hey, kid, what's your what's your game time tomorrow? And I said, unfortunately, 4 a.m. for you guys. And he's like, no problem, kiddo. And both mm -hmm. of them, my mom and my dad, are up at all hours of the day. It doesn't matter when my match is. They are up. They are watching it, and they're supporting. And it just it makes me feel really good knowing that my support system at home is just they're rock solid and they're always going to be in my corner, no matter what. I can't wait for them to hear that because yeah. again, my experience, and I think I've shared with you, like I, I lost my mom. It's been 20 years ago. Right. But like those, the moments, like there are times where I wish I could go back and say some of those things. So like, I, yeah. this is an opportunity for like anybody that's listening. Right. Mm -hmm. pause the podcast and throw a text, throw a, throw a call, do something to the, to somebody that maybe you haven't done, done, said something to in a while. Right. And because yep. we know tomorrow isn't promised. And one thing that you and I have in common is you've got it within your family, particularly your dad, and I believe your brother firefighters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, and again, both, I've got um, both of my brothers are firefighters and in the fire mm -hmm. service. So like, again, is, daunting as it can be, right? Like tomorrow isn't promised for any of us, let alone these people that are out there saving lives, doing everything that they can. So that's, yep. that, that to me is very powerful. And I, I appreciate you saying that for, to him. And I, I hope that he takes that yeah. in too. 
Oh my gosh, she's probably going to record this, send it to me, and be like, I love you, kid. <laughs> love it. But it's love great. It. It's great. Oh, <laughs> uh, so we talked club, we talked fork in the road. Okay, you yeah. need to decide. I've got different thoughts on that. Obviously, it's worked out for you, but I, th I think a lot of people out there think, you know, we force specialization early, particularly within the sport of volleyball, but even across. Mm -hmm. And your journey has been tremendous and it's taken you, you know, it got you a college scholarship, right? That, that's the dream when you're in club, when you're doing all that stuff. And for those that don't know, and you hit on it, right? You know, Wisconsin is where you ended up. Yeah. The interesting thing, it, I was coaching at the time or yeah, 2017, I was coaching at the time or four, 13 is when you uh, were a freshman. Yes. You had committed. You were the number one commit. You were the number one recruit in the country, you know, mm -hmm. Gatorade National High School Player of the Year, all these things. And you're committed to a program and have the head coach out there was Pete Waite at the time. And mm -hmm. Pete ends up getting let go, you know, mm -hmm. which happens, you know, for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. After that, you've got a decision to make. Like, here's here's. Oh my God. Like, I know I'm going here. I've chosen this, you know, coaching staff, all this is a piece of it. And now it's changed. Can you, mm -hmm. can you talk to me about that experience? Yeah. Fork in the road. Number two, um, right. could have gone two paths, right? Like, so I loved Pete. I loved that coaching staff, um, that they had, I'd got to know them over at least five, six years, just from going to camps from a really young age in middle school and senior year of my, um, high school year comes around and get the call that Pete was being, you know, let go and was stepping down. Um, and of course I was really sad. I was disappointed, um, that I wasn't going to be able to play for him, but I knew that I had also committed to not only him and the staff, I committed to Wisconsin and I loved Wisconsin for a reason. Uh, so I wanted to wait and see who the head coach was going to be, um, and talk with them first before I opened my um, basically recruiting back up. Sure. And so, um, it took them a little bit and they hired Kelly Sheffield and I still remember I was driving to practice and he gave me a call and he's like, Hey Lauren, I'm Kelly Sheffield. I'm going to be the new head coach of Wisconsin. Um, this is what I have in mind. This is my vision for this program and for this team. Uh, what do you say we do this together? And I was like, hell yeah, let's ride. Hmm. Like just how he, he's such a people person. He's such a great motivator and he makes you see his vision and his path. And ever since then, I was 1000% bought in, um, on him, the staff, uh, the university, just knowing that it was going to be the full package for me. I was going to play some kick-ass volleyball. I was going to get to be teammates with some amazing women um, I was going to get an education, a really good education and have a lot of fun while doing it. So it was a very easy decision for me, um, through and through. I mean, that's amazing. And what I heard very quickly, uh, Kelly's on the phone, right? And so he was at the university of Dayton prior to, yes. you know, so, so here Dayton uh, for a non-volleyball listeners, Dayton, you know, Kelly and the staff there did tremendous things at Dayton and took it to, and it continues to be at a very, at a national level, you know, from that presence. But here's somebody that's coaching in the A-10, you know, coming to take over a Big Ten program. And he picks up the phone and calls you, you know, the number one player, the number one recruit in the country and says, here's my vision and I want to do it together. And that to me, like what you said, like that gave me goosebumps. And again, I don't know Kelly very well. I know you know, Britt and I know Gary very well. Again, friends with both of them, amazing human beings. And obviously my interactions with Kelly, Kelly's a great human being as well. But like yeah. as a coach, very quickly in the first conversation he had with you, it's like, here's where we're going and you are such an integral part of it. And here's where I see we're going and let's get in this together. And that's, I, I want people to understand that. And that like that transcends coaching, that transcends sport, like that's business, like, the biggest thing is if you've got a vision, you bring it down to your, your people, whether it be a team, whether it be you workers, 
and you get them to buy in and you're in it with them and you actually give a rip about them. That's the bit like that to me is a major thing. You've got to, you have to be able to prove that you give a shit about the people that you're in the trenches with and you're doing this with. Yes. That's where you have success. And you mentioned, you know, they're in the final four, right? Like that's, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's from 2013 to now, like the program that has been built off of that, you mm-hmm. obviously had a major piece to do. So like, I want to tip my cap to you for, yeah. going in and doing what you did and buy like doing the buy-in. Cause again, having been on that coach's side, like that's a tough conversation that he had to have and a tough call yeah. and he doesn't know which way it's going to go. And then here you are, you start laying the foundation with him and the team and the staff for where they're mm-hmm. at right now. So like kudos, like you. Thank you. Him. Thanks. Yeah. It's about, he had to go and sell his vision, right? He had to go and sell himself and what he believed in. Um, and it's one thing to sell it, but it's another thing to 100 truly like 100% believe in it and know that you can do it. Um, and so, I mean, that was just a lot of hard work and determination and some failures along the way too, that we had to learn from and move on and get better. Um, so I also really like the point you made too, about um, kind of reaching down and bringing other people up with you it's about like linking together. And that's such an important lesson I had to learn while I was at Wisconsin, because when I got there, I was a hard ass. All I cared about was winning. I don't care whose feelings I had to hurt or what I said. I was like, we're winning. Like, this is the number one thing. And that's all great and dandy. But if the people around you don't think that you care about them, they're not going to want to play with you or for you. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had to get basically comfortable being uncomfortable and reaching out to people and understanding and having a little bit more empathy. Um, and I think it's really, it was a hard lesson and it was tough for me to step out of myself, my natural, I don't know, personality, uh, to do that. But I think it's really paid off over the years. And even now I find myself in situations where I'm like, I need to go and just get coffee with them and understand and talk to them. And, be cool with them outside the court because we're all human beings. We all have a lot of shit going on. Um, and getting to know people off the court is equally as important. Um, when it gets, when it's time to get back on the court together. Was there a moment that like, was like that aha moment for you? Right. Again, just so and it will go a couple different ways, but like mm-hmm. you said, you come in, you're a hard ass, you've got this, this, and this, but you realized quickly, right. It was, there something that stood out that you're like, Oh, sh- okay. I, this is, I need to change. Um, I would say one of the main things. So one of my best friends to this day, Haley Nelson, she, we came in together, same recruiting class. Um, I'm going to be honest. I didn't give her the time of day when we first came in together. I was like, listen, I know what we need to do. Like leadership, this is my spot Um, in terms of like, I'm going to be the one screaming, yelling, getting on people. Haley went about it the complete different way. She's one of those people who she's a total empath and she loves human interaction. She loves making people laugh and being silly and goofy. And when I saw that and saw people responding positively to that, and negatively towards statements I was making or things I was saying, that was kind of my moment where I was like, I need to be more like Haley. Okay. That's Haley's thing, right? Like she's going to do that. That is 100% within her personality um, and authentic to her. But where can I take a little bit of that and kind of, I guess, soften my edges per se. <laughs> so, yeah. And- yeah. And again, that's not, that's not an easy task, right? Because again, no. cause you said like, that's authentic to her. And in the next mm-hmm. breath, like through the relationship you and I built, like the authentic thing for you is right. That you are very passionate. You've got all these, th- like all of this stuff. And when you say soften the edges, like you were just, in my opinion, living the life that you thought that you were supposed to do, right? Like you've got these goals, you've got this vision. I and mean, you've talked about that multiple times, right? Hey, he, yeah. this is, play on the national team with all this stuff. And so you've created, I don't want to say creative, but you've lived this persona and then you get into this environment where it's like, Oh, okay. And like, I like relating it back to like, even just real life or, you know, a working environment or somebody, or even like a coaching staff, right? Like Kelly, Britt and Gary are all very different individuals. Right. Yes. But 
And I gear, and I'd be willing to bet, and you can shed some light on it if they evolve because they are, they worked together before they had gotten to Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. But like, I'm sure that there are things that Britt challenges Kelly with. And, you know, and Kelly evolves as a human being and like same thing with Gary. So like, was there, did you see that kind of an evolution in the staff and in the the team as well as that kind of grew? Yeah. And I think one, I would say we would not be anywhere close to as successful as we are now. If we had a staff or team that was all robots and we all thought the same and we, no one challenged anyone you're not going to get anywhere with this type of thinking. You need people who are going to see things a little bit differently and think outside the box. Um, So I think that's step one in any organization, team, whatever it may be, you have to have these out of the box thinkers Mm -hmm. Um, and be willing to say, I disagree Um, and have people willing to hear that disagreement and be okay with it. Um, And so it was actually really cool when I came in, we do, I think they still do it to this day. Actually, every year they do the disc test, uh, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. basically a yeah, personality. And I, as a setter, took a lot of pride in learning other people um, and how to interact with them and how to best, I don't know, I guess, get the most out of them um, when you're yeah. playing. So it was really cool. It's not manipulation. It's literally just learning how they interact and how best to make them work with you and work together. Uh, what makes mm-hmm. them tick? So you were you were a high D, weren't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you shocked? Yeah, a super. No, not, super not at all. ID. No. Yeah, and again, um, I'm sure. Hey, I'm sure Haley, like uh, her and I, were both we're both very high eyes. I know, like oh, I mean, I was off, like the, ch- off the chart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> and then S, I think it's like poker face. I have none of that. Yeah, it's <laughs> I. I'm thinking something or I'm <laughs> saying something. It's going to, it's 100% what I'm thinking. Like you yep. can see it all. Um, so yeah, just little things like that. I thought was again, really valuable and transcends volleyball. Um, it, it helps you grow and make connections and really skills that are going to take you far beyond the sport. 100%. And yeah. it's, in, you had a really cool journey at Wisconsin, right? I mean, again, mm-hmm. you, you received, you know, a lot of accolades and, Again, from the outside, you know, you guys are building a program. You had success. What's the uh, the furthest that you guys made it in the tournament? My first year, we went to the national championship. We lost the That's right. state in the finals. Yeah. That's right. And again, as a freshman, right, here you go, like, holy shit. Like, <laughs> and so you lay the groundwork. You do all of this amazing stuff. But I'm sure it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows, right? There are, there are moments right. there's like – and even if you look at, you reflect on like freshman year, okay, here's the very, very high highs. Mm-hmm. Were there any, like, were there, were there any moments of low or moments mm-hmm. of like, oh, you know, uncomfortability outside of just yeah. like from a growth perspective, but can you shed any mm-hmm. light on anything that was trouble, like challenging for you? For sure. And the first year, I would say in a lot of teams, organizations, like the first year is almost always the easiest. You don't really have that high of standards for yourself. You're just trying to kind of pave the path a little bit. Um, And then we land ourselves a national championship spot. Um, You know, one of the best two teams in the country at the end of the year. And you're like, wow, that that was easy. Okay, how do we get here, you know? Um, And it was just like, not luck, but it felt like that. It felt easy. It felt fun. And then... The next season, you have a target on your back. People can't take you for granted anymore. Um, They're not going to take it as an easy game. So you have to rise to the challenge there. Um, Junior year comes around, and we had a disappointing finish. Um, I want to say we we got knocked out in the Sweet 16 that year. So we roll into spring season, and that is going to be going into my senior year, my final season at Wisconsin. I still hadn't won a national championship. and there it felt like the weight of the world was on my shoulders and that spring was probably the hardest time of my life um i don't even know exactly what made it onset um but this was a time period where all spring i would go home and i would call my parents every night crying um because i was not in love with volleyball anymore i didn't enjoy going to practice i didn't find any solace in it Um, And I felt like there was just so many pressures that I was putting on myself and 
yes, I was getting a little bit of it from the staff and the team. Uh, but a lot of it is definitely like self-placed and self-implemented. Um, so finally, after a couple months, my dad was like, Lauren, you got to see someone like you have to talk to someone. Like we don't know what else to say and we don't know what else to do, um, especially from a distance. So I went and saw the uh, sports psychologist there within the athletic department. And it was like a breath of fresh air. It was like the light at the end of the tunnel. I could finally see it. And I was like, wow, how great it is to go talk to someone who's a third party who knows nothing about your life, nothing about volleyball, doesn't care about any of that, just wants to hear how you're feeling in that moment. Um, and so over the course of the spring, I saw her a couple of times and one, it was nice to just let things off my chest um, mm -hmm. and not have to worry about what I'm saying or who is hearing or if it's going to get relayed back to the coaches um, and also get some tactics in terms of how to deal with this pressure um, and how to just let some of it go. Uh, so I finally worked my way out of that one. And by the time summer came around, I was pumped. I was excited to play volleyball again. And I know people deal with this battle for a lot longer than what I did, but um, it, it, I don't know. It makes me empathetic towards people who are feeling that and feeling that heaviness in their chest um, and the weight of the world on your shoulders because it's not easy. And um, that was like another aha, big lesson moment for me. I've always been so independent, but at that point I need to reach, reach out and ask for help. And I needed a helping hand um, and someone was there to give it to me. So forever i'd always been preaching independence independence your thing like you can do this yourself that's not always the case like sometimes you need help and it is 1000 percent okay to ask for it that's that's huge coming from somebody of like your caliber and breath and just because you know i'll rewind and then we'll come back around but you talked about you know again the, the perception of you right like Here's this, here's this hard ass, the, the leader, the person that has it all together, right? And then everybody, and again, we're coming out of, we're in the middle of, you know, 20 months of a pandemic and people mm -hmm. having to sit with themselves, their thoughts and all this stuff. And so, you know, again, and I, I shared this on previous episodes, but like, I mean, again, I went through a dark time, like to where it's like, okay, I need to figure this out and I need to talk to somebody currently mm -hmm. in therapy and it's an amazing thing, but mm -hmm. what I want to like, was that a hard thing for you to sit and uh, I, I don't want to say, yeah, admit. And then also to then take that step. It was really hard. I, because for so long, I, I mean, I've always been just so fiercely independent and I love solving everything myself and doing things a specific way. And like my dad said, like, I couldn't get myself out of it. Like I needed someone else to be able to take a little bit of this burden off of me. Um, and so I, after this experience happened, I kept it to myself for a really long time. My, my coaches didn't know I was going to therapy. Most of my team didn't know. Only Haley knew that I was going. Um, so I felt like a little ashamed that I had to ask for help and reach out. And then as I started feeling better and being more willing to be open and vulnerable, I was like, wait, no, this can be so powerful. And the amount of people that need to hear this is greater than we know. And so uh, I would say about a year after that, maybe six, to mo six months to a year after that, I finally started sharing my story and telling people like, hey, I was going through a really dark time. And the only way I was able to get out of that was going and talking to someone like my friends couldn't do it. My family couldn't do it. Like I had to step out of my comfort zone and reach out. It, <clears throat> I want, I want to take a minute to like, to applaud you for that because again, having gone through it and then just knowing so many, like, I know that's not easy and I know it's not something that like, to, to take that step in and then also to take that even step further, to be a little bit vulnerable with somebody you don't know, to be able to receive help. So like, mm -hmm. I, I commend you for it. And also I, I want to applaud you for sharing it because if like a conversation I had with Matt Ginepro, uh, in my first episode, Matt, Matt's goal. And ultimately my goal is if the words that we're sharing and the things that we're doing help 
one person in whatever facet and wherever they're at in their life, right? Then it's a success. So like, I thank you for saying that. And I hope that anybody that's listening can sit and understand, right? Like this isn't the common theme of the podcast. I'm not sitting, trying to talk, uh, like I'm not reaching out to people and trying to find, Hey, are you in therapy? Great. Let's yeah. talk. No, but, <laughs> but there's, there's something about it. Right. And as it evolves, it becomes, I think it becomes more normal. And to your point, people are more comfortable sharing it because if it can help one person and if it can shed light on a situation, it's absolutely worth it. And what I find very interesting is it was your dad that said, Lauren, we can't help you. You need to go. And again, I, I go to the dad side of things, but I also go from the fire service side of things. And again, I know that like that, those are some of the people that deal with some of the, the most difficult things in the entire world and have to deal with PTSD and things like that. So for, I applaud him for kind of paying attention to those signs, because again, that's stuff that firefighters and first responders and all that stuff have to do, but like, and encouraging you to do that because most parents probably wouldn't want to do that either. Right. Like they want to help and they want to fix and they want to, but like, no. So like Mr. Carlini, like I tip my cap to you because like, that's, that's massive. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that he did that for you as well. Yeah, for sure. It was just, it was time to get out of that dark hole that I was in and um, just being vulnerable and being open was the greatest gift I could have given myself as well in that situation. So uh, vulnerability, you hear that Brene Brown, you've come up in our, in my <laughs> podcast twice now. So when Talk we want to talk, you, I, I mean, we, Oh, it's, uh, she's, she's a rock star. Like absolutely. She's insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She just, she just dropped a new book. Uh, I think Atlas of the heart or Atlas to the heart that I'm, I'm intrigued. Really? On. I need to, yeah, it, uh, I think it just right came then. out. So, um, okay. you should, yes. You should take a look at it. I haven't read it yet, but I, I've heard good things. So I need to actually pick it up. Okay. Um, okay. So therapy, let's go. I'm going to, I want to go back and then we'll go forward and I, it's going to be completely unrelated, but something you said earlier when you were in Italy, you have all this free time, the hobbies, you said you had yeah. to learn a hobby or anything like, did you pick any up and what, like, what were they? Yeah, I would say at the beginning of my, I would say both years in Italy. So for about two years, I was super into journaling and reading um, anything with words, right? So writing down my own thoughts, um, because my first year overseas, I slipped into a similar path that I was in my junior year and just had, I don't know, it felt like dark times. I was on my own for the first time, like really on my own in a foreign country, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. learning how to deal with that. Um, I was not super friendly with people. I didn't go out of my comfort zone to like go out with people and explore as much as I should have. Um, so I really got into journaling and writing down my thoughts and, um, you know, just things like that in general, uh, always been a big reader. Uh, so I started this like bookstagram thing on my Instagram. I really need to get back into it because I do thoroughly enjoy reading, uh, as just first off education. And, yeah. um, I'm a big fan of, really anything military. I love Navy SEALs, military. Uh, are you big, if you, if you listen to or read anything by Jocko, Jocko Willink? Of course. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Just, I, I, again, when you said military and everything, like Jocko oh, yeah. is extreme ownership. And I mean, it, so I totally derailed it, but go ahead, keep going. Oh yeah. Nope. All good. Uh, so yeah, I've read like all of his things, listened to a few podcasts. Um, my third year, I was really into podcasts. I, a lot of like true crime things. I don't know. These girls that like go through unsolved crimes. Yeah. I uh, listen to that. And now, okay, even though it's been COVID, I've been going out and doing a lot of things, exploring, finding coffee shops, um, mm -hmm. do a lot of shopping here. And then of course the usual Netflix filling in the spaces. So nothing like super substantial, but I would say journaling, reading, watching Netflix, and then finding new places to go and explore. Okay. So off of those, give me two or three book recommendations for, for our listeners. Oh man. Okay. Uh, it's the first to come to mind. It doesn't, there's no pressure on this. It's yeah. literally like lone survivor is amazing. Um, okay. lone survivor. That's a, a military book. Uh, let's see. The Tattooist of Auschwitz, incredible. 
Um, and the third great book. I'll try to think of like a good motivational one because I like to throw those in every once in a while. Um, oh my God, what's the name of his book? Okay, super crazy that guy who does all of like the marathons. He was in the military before. Oh my God. Oh, uh, David Goggins. David Goggins, his book also. I uh, can't which, even believe uh, the stories he tells is real. Wh- what was it? Was it, is it can't, uh, uh, can't Hurt Me? Can't Hurt it? Me. Well done. Go. Yes. Those are three. All right. This, so, and I'll, I'll link those in the, like in the description, in the show notes. So that way everybody knows a couple of Laura's yeah. favorites. Um, those are good. So we did books. We talked crew crime, uh, true crime podcasts mm-hmm. and then, Oh, Netflix. What are you, what are you oh, binging yeah. right now? Or what's a couple favorites? <laughs> uh, let's see. I trial by media has been really interesting actually. Uh, okay. long story short, they're just about, really unorthodox trials um that obviously go to court and are influenced by um all forms of media and basically the how it ends up is usually not how it would have verdicts would have been given out if there was not media uh so trial by media i just started selling tampa because i love selling sunset i love real estate and like learning all about it um, and also the drama behind it so the first one for selling tampa came out all right and all of the cheesy Christmas movies that I can find because it's that time of year. We, yeah, <laughs> we we watched. Corey was watching one the other the other night that I kind of got into. I forget which one it was, but it was about the uh, it was a holiday one. The girl got catfished and went to. Um, oh like, yes, they went. Oh, what's oh, it called? I'm, I don't know, but it was on because I was working on like some podcast edits and stuff like that. And I had the laptop and I'm like, Wait, what is this? So he, she watched that too. Yeah. It's with Nina Dobrev, I think, or something like that. Yeah. 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 They're all the same, really. They all do. End oh, up yeah. It's shocking. correct. Daddy, have you watched, uh, and again, having you being for traveling foreign and all of that stuff, uh, did you watch uh, the series, uh, the F1 series, uh, Chasing... Uh, I no, I tried to get into it last season because a lot of, honestly, like a lot of foreigners are really mm-hmm. into it. Um, yeah. And I, to this day, if I didn't do volleyball or softball, I'd probably be a drag racer. Um, I <laughs> haven't gotten into it though, as much as I thought I should. Yeah. Interesting. And that was one that, yeah, I got, I, we, I, we quickly got into it. I don't know somebody recommended, I started like the first couple and it's mm-hmm. it's pretty fascinating. Like you want to talk about a sport that's come out of nowhere and just gained in popularity True. across the globe. I attribute a lot of it to that documentary. It's I mean it, I think it's put it put it back on the map. And Ford versus Ferrari that I watch on every transatlantic flight. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I love it. Matt Damon and there you uh, go. what's his nuts? The other guy. Uh, um, why am I drawing a blank? You got me. Tall, skinny guy. You know exactly what yeah, I'm talking well, about. Yeah. What, what? What's his nuts? Yeah. Yeah. That guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, I mean, traveling. You mentioned transatlantic. We, you know, we're going all over the place. Um, yeah. Let's go. Let's go back into the gym. Let's go into. Let's go into the okay. gym with USA Volleyball, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. You you do the pro thing, and then all the while you're still you still have this dream, this vision, this goal, right? You know, mm-hmm. Olympics, winning gold, all of that stuff. So you start in with the national team. Can you talk to me about that journey a little bit for you? Yeah, the man, the USA team. It is tough. It is a challenging place to be in because it's the best of the best in the world. Period. Yeah. And you get to compete with them and compete against them every day. Um, so it's a really cool and overwhelming environment to step in, uh, to really step into when you are, you know, 21, 22 coming out of college. Um, so get thrown into that, right. And make a couple rosters here and there and try and find the rhythm of this fast offense and how much more physical everyone is, um, and try and find your, your niche, right? Like try and find who your small group of friends are going to be within the larger team aspect. Um, so that's the first couple of years is trying to figure out where you fit in, um, kind of where you are on the pecking order um, and working your way up and chipping away um, and trying to close those gaps. So I'm um, trying to think first year did, did I not make any rosters? I made, I think one or two big rosters. Yeah. Good start. Um, 
second year, I come back uh, after my year in Scandici and did not have a good summer with USA. And I think that's one of the crazy things that people don't really realize is it's not a consistent thing. If you are not up to par and you're not where you should be, they are not going to take you on these rosters and these big tournaments like World Cup and World Championships. Um, they have to make those hard decisions. Um, and so that second season with USA was not good for me. Uh, I went to Italy very early uh, for preseason. And that season, I ended up winning Champions League uh, with my professional team, which was incredible. And, no big deal. Uh, no big deal there, right? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slip that in there. Um, and so got back to USA really late. Uh, so me and Michelle Barch actually almost, <laughs> we got a couple days off, but we almost flew directly uh, to our Volley Nations League tournament that year. Um, had a great year, um, made every roster, was the starting setter. Um, and then dun, 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 COVID hit. Uh, yeah. So we were not in the gym really at all during that 2020 time period. Um, yeah. I was in there for a couple days, then ended up getting COVID. So I had to stop training. Um, and honestly, all through that, I felt pretty good. I still felt pretty positive. I know that I hadn't had a great season in Moscow. Um, mm -hmm. But I still felt confident in my abilities and um, how I was connecting with the girls. And I think a really big thing that we did for ourselves was say, we need someone to come in and consult us and basically be like our hype man. So we had a great, 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 amazing, wonderful human, Sue Enquist, come in during COVID time. Um, and she, I mean, she really righted the ship for us. I mean, righted the ship. That sounded really bad. I swear that's what I said. <laughs> um, and so, so she was incredible. Just being a team builder and building this culture that we hadn't had before. Um, we were doing Zoom meetings all the time. Uh, happy hours on Zoom meetings and just doing as much as we possibly could come from afar because we knew we had the talent, but we hadn't utilized it like we should have. Mm -hmm. So coming into 2021 now, um, had a good season in Turkey and I felt pretty good coming into the USA gym. Um, I knew that the gaps had been closed but in terms of setters um, and it was going to be, it was going to be tight. It was going to be a good competition. Um, so couple weeks of training they were okay uh i didn't feel particularly great about it but they were okay um and then go into vnl and just didn't had didn't have a very good feeling uh unfortunately we were in a bubble for six weeks yeah. and within that time frame we had to find out uh pretty much your fate are you going to be on the roster of 12 for the olympics or are you not um and I would say that was another one of the hardest times of my life was being in that bubble and finding out how we had to find out um, and trying to process and deal with all of those emotions while you were thousands of miles away from your family and your support system. So uh, that, that was really hard. Um, and then having to go after and continue training with them as we sent them off to the Olympics. So mm -hmm. A lot of character building this past year. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And we're rewind. And you said like one of the hardest mm -hmm. times was receiving that. And again, obviously being close with y'all when you were over there and all that stuff and communication, it, it was a roster, what, like 16? Is that what it was? It was in for VNL or it was it 18? Was, I want to say it was like, it was between 18 and tw no, it was 18. 20. 18. Yes, oh, yeah, because okay. six got cut. Yeah. So here's this, and obviously you, you know, as you mentioned, you weren't alone, but like when you, I guess I want to go back to that moment, not to, mm -hmm. to relive it, but just to kind of understand it. Right. And mm -hmm. like, how did, how did it go down? And again, you, you, you can divulge as much information as you want. And again, I, I know the coaching staff and all that stuff. So by no means is this an opportunity. I'm, we're not throwing anybody under the bus. I want people to understand you know, from one of the highest players, you know, highest, the best setters across the globe and all that stuff. Here's this moment and here's how this goes down. And like, I, I want to understand it a little bit better. Yeah. So I, so basically you could decide whether you wanted to have an in-person uh, yes or no, or yeah. if you wanted it via email. 
for me, I didn't have a great feeling because uh, this was week two. We had just finished and they kind of made an impromptu, I don't know, time when they were like, hey, we know already, like, we're not going to drag this out and make this harder for everyone. We're just going to do this tomorrow. So I didn't have a great feeling. Uh, so I decided to uh, take it in the way that I knew I was going to be able to handle it best. And so I decided to find out via email Mm -hmm. and email came through and I saw that my initials were not on the roster of 12. Uh, so of course took a second and just cried. I was beyond upset. Uh, and then I called my family and it's almost it's almost harder for me to see my family upset like that because I know I I was in control of it, right? And I feel like I also let them down because they have been along this journey with me as well. And they have sacrificed so much time and money and effort and I can't even begin to explain how much they've sacrificed to try and put me in the best position possible. Um, so of course my, one of my initial reactions was like, fuck, like I let down my entire family too. Like all the people that have supported me, i let them down and that's a heavy burden to put on yourself. Um, so yeah, it was really upsetting for me to see them equally as sad and heartbroken that I didn't, you know, achieve my, my dream and my goal that I'd set since I was in sixth, seventh grade. Um, And so I talked to them and when the roster got announced, we actually had an hour of time where it was like blackout time. So no one communicated with each other. Um, It was just like, let everyone process how they need to process. And if people want to reach out, they can reach out. So it was very, Mm -hmm. for the situation we were in, that was the best way I think they could have done it. Um, Just give everyone time to process and do it on their own time. Um, So yeah, it was just, it was really hard and it was heartbreaking. Um, and honestly, like in that moment, I didn't really see a light at the end of the tunnel. It was just like, this sucks so bad. Like <laughs> this is the hardest thing ever. I, I like, I feel the energy. Like I feel like I feel for you as you're talking through this, right? Because this is like, it's obviously something that was very emotional and like challenging and, one thing you said, and we're going to come back to the no light at the end of the tunnel, but one thing you said that s- sticks with me as you were talking about it with your parents and all that stuff, you said you were in control of it. And I, I love that you say that. And I'm going to, I, I want to challenge you at least a little bit because mm-hmm. you're only in control of yourself. And it's what this is, uh, this is my coach hat, right? Like you're in control of yourself. And if you can walk away sitting and saying, look, I gave, I busted my ass and I gave my 100% and I did everything that I freaking could. And this is still the result, right? Mm-hmm. Then you controlled everything that you could, right? Cause again, Karch and Aaron and, you know, and Tama and Luca and all like that crew, obviously they like their goal is to go out and they wanted they, the goal was to win gold. Obviously we, we yeah. found out spoiler alert. That's what happened. Right. So they put, they put, <laughs> They put together the roster that that did that. Now, mm-hmm. I, I'd be willing to bet that you and the other six people, and then the other the total of eighteen that were down on that final roster, literally did everything within your power. So, I I want to, and you may not still harbor those feelings, but I want to like applaud you for giving your one hundred percent because again, you yeah. you literally left it all out there, and I know that about you just through our conversations and our interactions. So. Mm-hmm. Like, I understand why you felt that way. And I also want to applaud you for doing everything that you could and understanding, understand that some things are out of our control too. 1000%. And I really like the way you worded that because I truly, I even said this to my family and everyone that was asking about it too. I said, I, I gave everything I possibly could. I gave a hundred percent every day. Everyone knows how passionate I am about my team and this sport. And I don't have any regrets. Like I did not leave anything out there. Um, the cars just did not fall my way this time. And, Mm -hmm. um, it's not fun to sit in and Mm -hmm. the, 
really great part is that I get to stand up and I get to continue trying and moving forward, um, challenging myself. And of course, you know, that roster of 12, there's going to be some girls that leave and a lot of the core group will stay. And so it's about getting back in the gym, doing, again, giving 1000% um, because I don't want to have any regrets at the end of 2024 thinking, wow, maybe I could have done something different. Maybe I could have done something more. I don't ever want to have that feeling really in any aspect of my life. And that's, that's the way to live. And again, that's a, that's a great transition because you talked about not seeing a light at the end of the tunnel, but here you are, you just, Mm -hmm. you sat and talked about 2024. So is like, what's the future? Yeah. I mean, it? it took some, yeah, for me, it, it took some time to, I don't know, kind of come back to terms with myself. Um, and honestly, I know myself and I know that that's not how I want to end. That's not how I want. That's not how my story is supposed to end. Mm -hmm. And if it's up to me, I want to go through 2024 with team USA. I'm going to make the hardest run I can at the Olympics in Paris. Um, and with the understanding that yes, I'm going to give a hundred percent and I'm going to give it all I got and leave it all out there. But also if this happens again, where I don't make the roster, it's, it's going to be okay. My career isn't a failure. Everything I've done was, didn't go to waste. Like I've done some incredible things and hoping I can do some more incredible things. And I know that this is what I'm supposed to be doing, where I'm supposed to be doing it. Um, and I find a lot of solace and in that, because this is my passion. And if I get the chance, I want to make a run at 2024. And after that, we'll see. I may be done with volleyball. Um, I may play a couple years in the United States, but um, that'll be more when the time comes. We'll make that yeah. decision. Well, and again, I applaud you for, again, picking yourself back up and like coming back around to kind of the vision and the goals and understanding, right? Like, I think the my biggest takeaway from what you just said was like, look, I'm going to, uh, this is, this is my goal and I'm going to do everything in my power for it toward to, to accomplish it. And in the next breath, it still may not happen. And we, again, when you talk, you know, manifesting, when we talk goals, when we talk all this stuff, we need to understand what we're trying to work towards. But again, to your point, we also need to understand that we only control one piece of that, the one piece of that puzzle and only our journey. And you never know what can happen. Like it can be, I don't know. It could be injuries. It can be people wanting to start families, looking for other avenues of life. There's so much stuff that can happen, not only to yourself, but to people around you. So follow, follow your dreams, work towards, Mm -hmm. work towards your goals and get it all you got. Because at the end, if you can rest easy at night, knowing you gave it your all, I can promise you, like, you're going to feel a million times better um, than if you kind of left things on the table along the way. That's, that's well articulated and that's going to be a sound bite for whenever we put, when we advertise this and get this out there. Right. <laughs> but, it, but it's the truth, right? Like, I mean, here's yeah. literally somebody that like, I keep going back to like me applauding you, but like you were at a very low place along with other members of, you know, the roster and all that stuff, but like questioning so much and it's like, okay, it's okay. And there's a, there's a phrase that I like to say with a lot of people and it's life happens every day. And yeah, like it, it's the truth, right? We we only have certain control over things, and it's uh, I, I'm I can't wait to watch the journey. And again, it's obviously a short runway, right? We're talking three; it's a three year yeah. runway to get into Tokyo. Like, so it's like okay, it's you don't you didn't necessarily have a lot of time to sit in it and be like eh, maybe, maybe like no, it's like okay, right. I've, I've got to make this decision, and here we go. Exactly, exactly, so. and you can you can choose the two view it a couple ways. You can see it as a failure or you can see it as an opportunity to learn and grow and fork in the road. I'm taking option number two. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow from it and I'm going to give it all I got. That's, that's amazing. And I, I can't, I can't articulate enough how much that, you know, I know myself and other people are going to be rooting for you and pulling for you and, you know, whatever, uh, following the journey for sure. So, um, thanks. 
you know, I, I think that we've covered a whole heck of a lot, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, this is, this has been an amazing conversation. And again, I'm like, I'm completely grateful that you've taken the time out of your day. I know it's getting later in the evening for you. So it's almost Netflix and chill time. I get that. Um, Seriously. I know. Right. Um, <laughs> but I want to, I'm going to ask one question, but before I do that, I want to, I like to try to wrap in showing a little bit of gratitude. And again, I know that you and I have had a relationship over the past several years by virtue of, you know, the, the real time job, the real job for me. And then also you, but like, I want to, I really want to like look you square in the eye and, you know, thank you for coming on here and sharing your story with, with individuals. That's like, that's the whole premise of steps and what I'm trying to bring to life. Everybody has a story and it's unique to them. And I, I applaud you and I'm grateful that you you've shared some of it. And I know that this is going to go ahead and help more than one person, whether it be the, the youth volleyball player that stumbles across, across this because their coach or mom or dad sent it along, or maybe somebody trying to go pro or anything along the lines. But like, I applaud you and I'm grateful for your vulnerability because I know that some of the stuff that we talked about isn't easy to do. And it's, I, I, I'm glad that this, I, I hope this was a safe space for you to share and I am grateful that you did. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me on really. Like I've appreciated you over the years and just your friendship and your, um, your help throughout the years. And I think with this, what you're doing here and letting people share their stories and kind of dig down deep, um, is gosh, like you said, just really going to help as many people as possible for whoever needs to hear it. And, uh, I'm just, I'm excited and I hope this helps people. And I hope this inspires and motivates people to really just keep going because I know we've all had a really hard couple of years. Um, and like I keep saying, there's this light at the end of the tunnel and keep working towards it and keep searching for it. Um, you know, life is what you make it. So let's make the most out of it. I love it. I love it. So where can, where can our listeners, where can they connect you or find you? What's the best way to uh, kind of follow Lauren's journey? Yeah. Um, I would say Instagram or Twitter. Both of them are at Lauren Carlini, uh, super easy. And yeah, you're just going to see a little bit of my life, my travels and a lot of volleyball stuff. <laughs> I love and Carlini it. Well, again, consulting in the future. <laughs> Carlini consulting. We're going to, we're going to have an offline yes. conversation about that. Um, I'll link all, I'll link all of those in the show notes, but uh so in closing, in, in in wrap, right? I want to put a nice big, it's the holiday season. I want to put a bow on it and I'm going to ask you a question and it's going to bring everything together. And my question for you to finish our finish episode, I think this is going to be episode three that I'll launch. Yay. It'll probably be in right after January, but to put a bow on it, who is Lauren Carlini? Who is Lauren Carlini? I am a passionate driven, hard work, working woman. Oh, that's about as clear and concise as we can get. And <laughs> I, and I, and I love it. It's you to a T. So yeah, that's, that is Lauren Carlini. I love it. Well, Boom. I appreciate the time, my friend. I know it's uh, getting late there and we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up, but uh, and I'm forever grateful for you. Oh, thanks. I appreciate you. No worries. We will talk very, very soon. Sounds good. I can't thank Lauren enough for her vulnerability, willingness to share, and most importantly, her real conversation. I hope that each and every one of you took at least one thing from this episode. For me, some of the quick takeaways revolve around the fact that we can't always rely on our closest friends and family members when we're in dark places. That creating an environment where people know you care about them is crucial for success. And that athletes are more than just athletes. They're people first. What were your takeaways? What were you left with? Let me know over on my Instagram at Steve Venzel, S-T-E-V-E-V-E-N-C-L on the post for this episode. Additionally, please share this with someone who may benefit from hearing these words. That's what it's about, sharing people's stories and understanding how to keep moving forward. Thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And until next time, keep moving forward, even if it is just one small step at a time.